Um, so Michaela's working on wheat um, diseases, a number of different projects. One of the primary ones is head scab. Um, so she's doing a survey of fusarium species in the state. And because that pathogen, that fusarium pathogen that causes head scab, is the same pathogen that causes ear mold on core, at least gibberella ear mold, we're dipping into that too a little bit. So doing a bit of work on the core as well to understand that that um, system or the, the uh, species on, on the corn as well as on the wheat because it overlaps. Um, so here today we've got a fertility trial, fertility by variety by fungicide, and this is in conjunction with uh, Dr. Kurt Steinke's group. Uh, we were looking at that, and I'll let Michaela talk about that in a minute. But just in general, uh, 2018 in terms of wheat diseases, it's, it's been pretty quiet, right? Any sense as to why it's been so quiet in terms of diseases on the wheat this year? Cool early, maybe? Cool early? And dry now, I guess, right? So, yeah. so we had such a late spring, those that, you know, below normal um, April temperatures really put a, a stop to disease development, right? So diseases develop much like we would like compound interest to work for us at the bank, right? You know, I know rates are pretty low, but ideally, you know, with a good interest rate, we can accumulate and, and grow on that, that, that principle, right? And it's the same thing for, for wheat diseases. It's exponential. Once we get some infection, you get spore production, more infection, it, it just grows exponentially. It has that capacity to build pretty quickly. But because temperatures were below average in April, it really put a, a stop to all of that. So the, the normal diseases we'd see early, like powdery mildew and septoria, didn't have a chance to cycle once or twice before we got into May. And then we hit May and temperatures were above normal. And up in this region, we're, we're pretty dry, right? So that's also impacting disease development. Uh, related to that too, the striped rust uh, across the nation has been pretty quiet this year. The last two years, uh, 2016 and 2017, levels of striped rust were quite high and, and some of those same factors I just talked about are playing into that as well. And because we don't have that spore production down south, we don't have those spore loads being dumped onto us um, from our, our southern uh, states as well. So that, that's another factor that's, that's sort of driving things. And this year we've, we've only picked up striped rust about uh, two weeks ago now on campus, Michaela found in some of her research trials there. And then just today, Michaela found like one leaf with some strike rust on it. So it's here, but it's so low and it's so late now that it's not really going to be a factor, right? So it's been very, very quiet. Um, with that, I'll let Michaela just talk about this trial. And just because it's been a quiet disease year, that's fine in terms of some of these trials because we're looking at the economics. What is the economic implications of some of these management decisions that we're making? So we're standing in the first range here of our um, trial. So we're replicated four times. So that flag there in the back is the last replication. And like Marty said, we're looking at different varieties, um, different nitrogen rates, and uh, different fungicide application timings. So this first um, variety that I'm standing in here, about uh, to there, is Ambassador. And then we have um, Dynagro 9242, uh, Pioneer 25R40, and uh, Starburst. So we have two reds and two whites. And then we also want to make sure we represented different resistance packages. So um, Ambassador right here is very susceptible to both head scab and leaf diseases. You might be able to see a few um, scabby heads. This uh, fill here is a lot easier to see because of its green color. So you can see some of these um, are half uh, tan, half green. That's going to be your head scab. And um, we are seeing it here at very low levels. Like I said, it's been pretty dry. So it's not been super favorable, but we do see a few heads. But mostly in those susceptible varieties. So in this trial, Ambassador was really the only place that we saw head scab. Um, but we wanted to include those susceptible varieties so that we can see how a fungicide application uh, is compared to um, more resistant varieties. So on an ambassador, you, you might see a profit from that fungicide application, but on a very resistant variety, especially in a year like this, you might not see any uh, return from that fungicide application. And then we're looking at three different nitrogen rates. So um, our lowest is 80 pounds. And
from neighboring states and other countries has shown that higher nitrogen rates can sometimes push disease in wheat. And that's for a variety of different reasons. The nitrogen could change um, kind of the structure of the canopy and might encourage disease that way. You have more vegetation or by just having more available nutrients in the leaves for those pathogens. So we want to look at um, if nitrogen exacerbates that disease and then how can those fungicide applications combat um, that disease as well and if there's any synergism uh, some added benefit from the fungicide when you're using higher nitrogen rates. Um, so we repeated this last year uh, but last year we had very low disease as well so we didn't see a ton of differences um, so we're excited this year to get our yield data back. We have really nice farm plots so we should get some good yield data from that. Any questions on that trial or um, any of those inputs? couple other things that we've been seeing this season because we did have that, that very slow uh, start to the season has resulted in some physiological leaf spot right so a fungicide is not going to fix that physiological leaf spot it, it's just going to occur and so if you look on the flag leaf there's quite a few sort of translucent lesions on the on the uh, flag leaf and it depends a lot on the variety some varieties tend to show up more than others but that's very much a temperature effect those very uh, warm conditions uh, quickly like that. So we've, we've seen a little bit of that this year as well. Uh, just in terms of head scab, uh, it's been pretty low uh, in terms of head scab risk. Uh, the, the head scab model showed pretty high risk in southern Michigan towards the end of May, but then that, that really disappeared on the model, which surprised us, but, but most of the time that model was correct. Um, so that, that was interesting to see. Um, in terms of fungicide use, we, we typically you know, would recommend something like Carumba or Prosaro uh, to manage head scab to reduce the severity. Um, Syngenta have a new product called Aravis Ace, and it's it's on this that sheet of paper that's in your packet if, if you need to look up the name. But what's exciting about that is that we're seeing pretty similar levels of control as those other standard chemistries. But the most important thing to us is that it's a different mode of action. This new chemistry that was Syngenta is an SDHI and those other chemistries are triazoles. And so that's excellent. Very much like the, the whole story in, in weed resistance to glyphosate. It's, it's the same sort of thing, right? We've got a different mode of action for the head scab. And so that, that's a really good thing in terms of being able to potentially rotate chemistries and, and not put so much selection pressure on that triazole chemistry. It's really good. In terms of um, efficacy, we're seeing pretty similar levels to those those Carumba and Prosaro uh, treatments, and, and Martin Overkirk and I have trials to continue to look at that. Uh, one thing you might hear is about the potential to put it on prior to flowering, but I would certainly not recommend that for head scab management. I think there was maybe one trial that, that might have sort of showed some data that you know might have looked interesting that way, and we're following up on that, but we really don't think that that's going to be. Um, you know, something that's going to hold up over time. So if, anyway, just, just a, a note of caution. And in terms of application timing, we're really talking about um, from the beginning of flowering, which is heads, 50% uh, of the heads that have to have an anther on them, right? That's our uh, day zero. We have seven days from that period to maximize our head scab management, right? That seven day window. And we see on average probably about three to four days into that flowering period, that's when we might get, you know, that maybe that, that little bit of extra, extra control. But as long as you're within that seven day window, you're, you're going to be pretty set in terms of maximizing your, your efficacy. Um, and one other thing just related to this morning's talks, um, in terms of the, the wider row spacing and trying to just, just get more uniformity, larger heads and, and hopefully more uniformity up there. Uniformity of, of heading and flowering would be a good thing, right? at the moment we've got tillers that you know are, are throwing out you know, flowers a little bit later than the primary head and so of course if you're trying to make your application within the seven day window you might actually still have you know, some of your plants flowering beyond that that seven day window for, for most of the heads so if there's more uniformity through you know potentially planting technologies that might actually help with some of the head scab management too particularly when we're using a fungicide so there might be some interesting things to look at here in the future. Does anyone have any any questions for us? Did you want to say anything final? 
Oops. And there it is. We got the lunch take. But our wheat is very much dictated here in terms of how it looks uh, based on the weather we've had from uh, May 16 to June 1. This has only received, uh, and since then, I'm guessing only um, maybe a third of an inch of rain at the same time in that same period. We had about 10 or 11 days of uh, in excess of, uh, of 80 degrees. So, especially in the Saginaw Valley in the sun, we don't have a lot of experience with droughty wheat, but we're getting pretty close. With wheat, it takes most of its moisture at about a food stage. And actually, it doesn't require all that much moisture as we get into this critical phase of grain fill, but it does need some. And so I'm not sure what the impact is going to have, but out this way we worry when the leaves are rolling uh, most days as it is today uh, on wheat. That certainly is impacting diseases too, but the same thing that's inhibiting disease at this point is also the same thing that's inhibiting wheat production, so that's a little unfortunate. I would like to visit where some of you guys are from, where you have so much rain, but we all share that diseases were very slow to get going. I would, think, I would guess that uh, some of you will feel pretty good if you use a fungicide at flowering, because I would guess that the, the diseases are going to come visiting, and they often do, about one to two weeks after uh, after flowering. And the game is still very much at, at, at play. We want that green fill period to go as long as we can, maybe 30 days, and we take more if we can get to it. But that depends on that head and that flag leaf being healthy. And so uh, I think that that'll uh, keep a good stead. Uh, out this way, we probably haven't invested our, our dollars uh, all that long. Yeah, if you stand back higher, I mean, just look at those leaves. It's not, it doesn't have the same look as corn, right? or even out here. But yes, they call that leaf roll, and it just rolls right into itself. I mean, it's clearly, and, and even, even if there's adequate moisture, sometimes, just like with corn, with really hot temperatures, they'll do that. But, guy, when that starts that in the morning, we're just not used to that. That's um, on sandy knolls, maybe. But. Yeah. But we're, uh, it's painful to watch. Oh, you're used to it. <laughs> we're used to sand okay. and, and drought. So, yeah, so, we're yeah. not. So it's a little painful to watch. <laughs> Any uh, questions or uh, comments? We are seeing a little bit of burn following some of our fungicide treatments here in the last two weeks. So do watch for that. And it's not a real obvious burn. I mean, we're getting uh, tip burn here just because of conditions. But some discoloration of the flag leaf and the second leaf have any of that, I'd like to hear about it because we'd like to get to the bottom of that. That's not something we want to do. Whether you're in a rain zone or in a dry zone, that's not something that we want. Um, uh, how much water um, would water potentially help? I don't think it matters very much. I could say for a long time using triazoles are not very hot at all and so whether you give me a five gallons or 20 gallons i'm not going to do it all right? I mean, i'm not going to have a problem unless there's an extenuating circumstance i guess it's more related to what we had with the tank how much nis are we putting an insecticide on there in a drift agent are we making it too hot is my question and that's my suspicion in isolated cases um and then if you have a split field if you can find one that has some treated and some not, and you have those symptoms, uh, we'd really like to jump on that just to see what the, the yield implications might be. I don't think it'll be drastic, but it won't be one bushel either, so that adds to the expense of that operation as well. 